I think we should get started. Uh, this feels like the Apple Store in the mall. That's where all of the action is on an otherwise quiet floor, and and uh, that's very cool. And we're um, we're very happy about that. Um, Camille Martinez, my partner in the uh, OFD enterprise, um, and I uh, welcome you here for what I think is probably the first uh, mid-career faculty forum um, in the university's uh, history. If, if there's been others, I don't remember it, and uh, I'd have to have my uh, memory jogged by somebody um, a little, uh, who's been here a little bit longer, <laughs> but th not a lot of people that uh, have been here longer. Uh, and um, we're hoping that this will be um, a kickoff event for an ongoing conversation about matters that are rich and challenging and that cannot be um, easily uh, resolved or fully addressed in a single meeting. And so um, our distinguished uh, panelists will be speaking very briefly so as to permit most of the meeting to be devoted to a conversation um, in which we would like to um, solicit your suggestions for how to follow up um, and what you think we need to do. Um, the, um, in a moment, I'm going to introduce the panelists and ask uh, you to briefly um, introduce yourselves. I do want to mention um, that because a number of people could not be here today due to conferences that they are attending, um, we, were, we were asked, um, actually pleaded with, to tape the meeting. And because of the, um, the push and pull between openness of the event and being able to um, disseminate it and the um, other uh, the the other concern which is to have a free and uh, open and frank conversation we've decided that we would um, we would videotape the panelists presentations and then shut off the camera and close the door and have a conversation um, in which uh, people would feel um, feel more relaxed about, um, about speaking candidly. So um, without further ado, let me introduce you to our group of panelists. Bob Chen from Environmental Studies, uh, Cheryl Nixon, Chair of the English Department, Rajani Srikanth, Associate Provost, Director of Honors, soon to be Honors College, and um, member of the English Department, and Peter Kiang, um, College of uh, Education and Human Development and Asian Studies. Asian American Studies, excuse me. We, is everybody included? Um, I, I want to just um, preface this by providing um, a definition, a loose definition of mid-career faculty. I want to clarify a common assumption that mid-career faculty means only um, associate provost, post-tenure, excuse me, associate <laughs> means, means only associate professors, I was looking at Rajani, <laughs> means only associate professors. But um, in the literature, mid-career faculty is not necessarily distinguished by rank. It's distinguished more by years, by, by the years of a career that follow pr the probationary years. For a tenure member of the faculty, that would be post-tenure. For a non-tenure uh, stream member of the faculty, that would mean after the probationary years are over. And within, and, and then through one's career till about, you know, seven, seven to ten years before retirement. Um, and so the, um, the, the mid-career years do encompass both the, the, the ranks of associate um, and full professor. And our discussion today 
will um, make an effort to include the interests um, of both those uh, faculty in both of those ranks. And I just want to tell you what the prompt was for our panelists uh, before they begin. Um, I wrote to the panelists and asked them if they would speak for five minutes about how they've approached the challenges of, stay, of staying positive, active, and fresh and engaged in the areas that we've asked each of them to speak about. And um, to also broach, but not to um, necessarily examine closely, um, their ideas or suggestions about initiatives or structures that would serve mid-career faculty. Um, so that's, their, that's the prompt, and Bob will be speaking um, to these uh, questions regarding faculty scholarship, Peter teaching, um, Cheryl to service and leadership, and Rajani to staying um, on track toward promotion. Uh, so Bob, thank, thank you. you. So um, I'm not sure that any of my comments are specifically towards scholarship or that you can separate scholarship from teaching and, and service, and, and I think that'll probably be a trend through here. But I just have a couple slides that have been developed over the last few years uh, in a variety of different, different areas. But um, the first one is, is sort of looking at your career and, and where you start from and where you end. Um, and oftentimes we think about this bottleneck, which is tenure. Okay? So while you're focused on tenure, and all the research and publications grants realize that you have a lot more skills and experiences that make who you are before that bottleneck of tenure. So there's family trips, there's museums, there's K through 12 education, undergraduate, graduate education, but then there's just your passions. Um, uh, a field trip, at a, at a, at an incredible um, meeting of someone who has made an impression on your, on your mind. There's advertising. There's uh, a movies. There's all those experiences that sort of lead you along. You try to slough off a lot of that stuff and say, it's just about my research, my publications, my grants. Um, get that stuff out, and let me see if I can pass the, the hurdle. But on the other side of tenure is the whole other side of the tree. And it's not that the job of faculty member is just research and grants, or whatever it happens to be, teaching and whatever. Um, there's all these possibilities. You can be known as an educator. You can be known as an innovator or an inventor. You can be known as a, 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 an author, a publisher, a, a book writer. You can be known as an administrator or a dean or, or whatever it happens to be. Um, and those take different skills. And they take different skills than necessarily what you put in your package for tenure. And so don't throw away all that stuff pre-tenure. <laughs> Celebrate it, enhance it, and then use that to then decide what might be the thing that you might do, and it might not be one of those things. It might be parallel all of those things, or in secret, in series, some of these things. And so, um, so there's there's a lot of possibilities, and there's a lot of job descriptions. And one of the things I like to think about the academic job and the freedom of the academic job is that you can do many jobs. So, um, so those are just a few, but here's a, a graphic to sort of represent that. The second point is um, you probably heard about 10,000 hours <laughs> from Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers. Um, you know. You're not born into some job or career. You work really hard at it, and you practice at it. And to become, a, from a novice to an expert, takes a lot of work. And we do a lot of work pre-tenure. We do a lot of work post-tenure. We do a lot of work on research and teaching and all this stuff. Um, 10,000 hours turns out to be, if you work 40 hours a week, if you work just 40 <laughs> hours a week, is um, 4.8 4 years. And it's not by chance that so many people outside of academia change their jobs about every seven years. You are a novice, you learn a lot, it's exciting, you're continuing <coughs> on, and then you plateau because you've become an expert and you've figured it out. And that doesn't become so exciting anymore because you're not learning so much anymore. And so you shift careers, or you shift jobs, or you shift companies, or you, you do that. Um, so you know, here's, here's the ranks, but I think this is true of just what you're doing, is sort of shifting. In academia, you stay in the same place, you're a faculty member, you're, you're a professor, but what you do probably is going to shift a lot because you're interested in something else and you're learning some new things and that's where the energy is and that's where you're excited about learning something and you can do that for five or six or seven years until you've mastered it and then move on to something else that's new and exciting. So um, 10,000 hours is sort of a catchy thing. Um, a lot of people get a kick out of this one, and I've left the names in here for some reason. Um, <laughs> I, I, I put it in somewhere that no one would recognize the names, but you probably recognize some of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. But the, um, 
the university culture is reliant on faculty. It's not on the administration. It's not on the, all those people that sort of come and go. And one of the reasons I put this up is because the, the, the culture of a university is really hard to change. Because <laughs> faculty are here for 30 or 35 years, which is great. But it's also that's your responsibility, but how you set the university is the faculty's responsibility. So here's you know, just the example of, of deans and provosts and chairs coming in and out every couple years. And they have some new ideas, and it's great. And there's an infusion, and then they go away. But that what you really are about are these guys have been sitting here for, this is just a 10 year snippet, but you can think about expanding this to 30 years. And you go, well, that's a large responsibility that I want to set what the university is and where they're going. Uh, in research and scholarship for my particular thing, but for sort of anything. And there's also some you know, advantages. That the, the reason that we have tenured faculty in, in academia is for this intellectual freedom. I can go do six years of something that sounds absolutely crazy. I can become an expert and, oh, look, I've reaped the benefits. It actually made a real advantage for the university and shifted the culture. Whereas in a, a position where you're worrying about your job for the next six months, you don't have that um, intellectual freedom and you can't take those risks, those academic risks, uh, those uh, intellectual risks. And then the sabbatical years that come every seven years again is not an accident. After 10,000 years, you need some refreshing. 10,000 so, 10, hours. 10,000 years. 10,000 hours. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like, it's, it feels like that sometimes, yeah. But after, after 10,000 hours, you want to go and get some new infusion of ideas so that you can come back and, and, and be a complete novice again and reinvent uh, the wheel. Um, does anybody recognize this? This picture? No? no? You've all used it today. No. It's the internet. Well, the internet. Oh. It's the internet. <laughs> we live in a world of networks, and networks are not homogeneously distributed. They, they have nodes which are really active and lots of energy and lots of connections, and then there's sort of quiet periods. And this is in space, and it's also in time. And as we progress through our careers, we might find ourselves, for whatever reason, we sit next to someone on a plane, we read someone's paper, we, we go to a conference and someone likes our talk, we connect with other people that might be connected to a whole nother node, <laughs> a whole nother world, a whole nother network that we're not familiar with. And then we can go explore that, that network. Which we, we sort of become an expert in there and we've established that, you might jump off and find some other piece. And so it's infinite, really. And there's so many different directions that you could go with your career and your scholarship and your research and your intellectual um, capacity, but you can find just any, you don't know where one of these connections are, but it can open up this whole new world. And if you become unactive, like say, I only want to do the thing that I've always done, then you'll never discover any of the other nodes out there in the world of, of the network. So that, that's the, sort of the, the four slides I want to show you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. I mean, looking at who's in the room, I'm really embarrassed to be the one asked to speak because you know, I think anybody here could, could be talking about teaching. Um, you know, our, our research areas and our service responsibilities might differ dramatically depending on our locations, but um, we're all committed teachers. And um, so I think I, I want to connect with a little bit of the overview piece first and then just think with you about some specifics in terms of maintaining fresh teaching. Um, the Fontaine Gora into Langley Motley years are the years of the mid-career faculty. And uh, I can remember vividly um, Provost Fontaine speaking to um, a group of the incoming um, faculty one, one September. And he was commenting on the, the demographic profile of the UMass Boston faculty at that time, which was um, very heavy senior, senior faculty um, coming into retirement. And then a, a gap among the mid-career faculty. And then you know the beginnings of the, the um, assistant professors coming in and revitalizing the campus. So that was the reality of the faculty profile maybe 12, 15 years ago. And so the demographic bulge of that assistant professor level faculty is now the mid-career faculty. And so that is, I think, um, the reality that Judy, you are responding to and the, the request for assistance in thinking about how to support and nurture and um, make maximum use of the mid-career faculty makes perfect sense in terms of a demographic analysis of 
you know, where the faculty have been, who they are now, and where they're going. So um, just kind of recalling the provost's uh, comment at that time was, you know, on my mind this morning. Uh, I still continue to believe that the Bergen Public Research University with the teaching soul is, you know, our identity. And so the teaching soul, where's the soul for the mid-career faculty in your teaching? I mean, bottom line, I think that would be the question that I would, I would want to ask myself regularly. Where is my teaching soul? Um, like uh, Bob said, I think, um, you know, these domains, I mean, I, I wrote about this in my own tenure statement many years ago. I don't separate the domains in my own conceptualization of my work. Um, teaching, service, and scholarship are all interconnected, integrated. Um, I, I try to view my work as much as possible holistically. Um, and we're doing our talk this way um, for obvious reasons, but this is maybe not the only way to think about the work. Uh, and I think especially for mid-career faculty, the holistic integration of what we really care about, um, we have the power and the flexibility and the freedom um, to actually enact that. Um, so uh, I feel like those who want to should really take that opportunity. Um, and then I think also just generationally, I mean, this is certainly, you know, family context and individual realities um, differ dramatically, but generationally, you know, a lot of mid-career faculty um, may have responsibilities both in parenting and in also um, caretaking for uh, their own elder parents. And so that sandwich reality of just having a lot of responsibilities which um, are not your professional responsibilities but are um, daily uh, and really intimate and important, um, that's just, I think, part of the profile of many mid-career faculty as well. And we know teaching at this institution how much our students' personal lives enter into what they're able to do in school, in the classroom. Um, and so, of course, as those issues um, may become even more intense in terms of the faculty's responsibilities, the impact on the classroom is uh, very real uh, as well. So it's just kind of commenting on the, the, the bigger picture. Um, so in terms of teaching itself, I think, just some quick thoughts, you know, no answers, no formulas, no, no easy things to do. It's, I mean, inspiration is great, but practice uh, over time is where things really have impact. So uh, I think we're looking for a little bit of inspiration, but then it's also our dedication and our commitment to carry out something, um, you know, in a serious way over time. So in terms of staying fresh in teaching, some of the maybe um, points of inspiration, but then that need follow-up in terms of actual dedicated practice. Uh, one might be um, peer observation. Uh, you know, for a lot of us, it's kind of scary being observed. Um, and there's sometimes, depending on your departmental culture, there's evaluation and assessment that's kind of wrapped up with the act of observation. But it doesn't have to be that way. And simply inviting someone that you trust um, to watch what you're doing and give you feedback on specific things that you care about. It's not that you're asking them to just observe anything and whatever comes to their mind um, is what you get you know, talked to. But something that you really care about that you would like some feedback on from a trusted peer or offering to do that to somebody else or with somebody else, to be the trusted peer of somebody else. So I think just that engagement in um, teaching with peers, that's, I mean, it's a little bit different from a CIT seminar. Um, it's really, a, it's a classroom space. Um, and it's, that can be a very intimate, uh, vulnerable space, but it's also a very dynamic and, and exciting space. And to share that um, often will lead to other commitments or, or ideas or possibilities uh, for you as well as for the person that you're trusting to, um, that space uh, together with. Um, curriculum mapping is another thing. So you can think a lot about in any particular course. You know, you have certain goals about content. Um, but what, and, and what you place at the center of your, um, your goals and intentions with your curriculum, 
um, makes a big, big difference. But what if you put something else at the center? What would the curriculum then look like? So for example, um, and, and this is a way of aligning a little bit with the public research university with the teaching soul. What are the constituencies that are really important to this university in this period of time? So for example, veterans. Um, what does your curriculum look like from the experiences, voices, perspectives of veterans, <coughs> both as students perhaps, but also in terms of the content of the curriculum? Maybe there's no connection at all, but maybe there's something and you hadn't really thought about it. But by going through the exercise of recentering your curriculum, maybe some new ideas come up and that can lead to some very exciting things that you otherwise might not have considered. And it is a way of aligning with you know, populations or with issues or themes um, that the university uh, overall is, is taking seriously. International students, you know, clearly the population has, is growing and will continue to grow, um, particularly students from China. So what does the particular course look like from the vantage point of China, of people who have grown up in China culturally, economically, socially, uh, et cetera? And just kind of thinking about that, what happens when you recenter stuff in your own <coughs> curriculum? So observation, curriculum mapping, and then a, maybe a third idea is um, alumni reconnection, or reconnecting with former students. So you've had relationships that probably have been very important to you over time as junior faculty, uh, you know, at, at whatever point in your career. And you have email addresses for them, and probably some you've stayed in touch with, or they have stayed in touch with you wanting recommendation letters. So that's kind of a, uh, a specific role to play. But maybe there's other questions um, and reconnections that you would want to have with some of them. Um, because you did share teaching and learning experiences together. They're in a different place now, but what would they remember that was you know, kind of meaningful now? How could they and what they're doing now be useful to you in your teaching now? So just really thinking about the longer term nurturing of those teaching and learning relationships with former students and how you might be able to tap that. Um, so all of that, you know, if you try any of that, then it's really about reflection and um, taking the time to actually reflect. So, you know, we're, we're crazy, hectic all the time just, you know, managing our classes. Um, we're making decisions all the time about what's important, what we're leaving out, et cetera, et cetera. But the reflection process is asks you to be disciplined enough to create space and time to think, not just to react. So most of the time we're just in react mode. But the reflection, um, I don't think you can improve as a teacher and sustain the improvement without having the space for reflection. Sometimes it's with peers, sometimes it's to yourself, sometimes it's with pen and paper or you know notes on your phone or whatever it might be. But the reflection part is really, really important. Um, and some of that can lead to scholarship of teaching, which then gets into you know whole other areas of writing and productivity. Um, you know, and we have great examples of, on this campus, Esther Kingston Mann, Estelle Dish, Tim Siever, et cetera. You know, they were not education faculty or you know faculty like Vivian Zamel, um, who's you know, research is about pedagogy and curriculum design. But they have separate areas in the scholarship of teaching that ended up being highly productive and influential. So you can do that as a mid-career person. And, um, and then you're also playing leadership roles in writing up the teaching statements of colleagues when you're doing tenure narratives, you know, and, and reviews, or when you're writing up nominations for people for awards. And so getting really good at being able to write about someone else's teaching is another way of using your reflection on these issues. So you know, that's a service contribution um, that's directly related to the same process. So you know, in my mind, getting good at this is going to contribute to a lot of other things as well. But you know, I don't have much to say about your particular departments, but I think what I was trying to think about were different things that any of us could do, you know, regardless of our location. Thanks. I think that a lot of what I'll say will echo what's, what um, previous panelists have said. 
And really, I think Peter sort of set it up very nicely with, with talking about thinking of the career holistically. And uh, I'll be speaking on service, and I think that service is a, a very big, can be a very big part of what we start to emphasize mid-career. Um, I think that in some ways it's easiest to talk about service because there's many, many opportunities for service on campus. In fact, there's too many opportunities. <laughs> and as you know, that we're, we're probably most struggling with what to say no to rather than what to say yes to. So um, I think especially, again, sort of playing off of what Peter said, especially if we're sort of in this mid-career moment now, there's still lots of new hiring, new, that bulge is continuing. There's a lot of people behind us that I think that very quickly those of us mid-career are able to step into what we might call leadership positions because we're the beginning of that, that bulge and there are a lot of people behind us that we want to play maybe good mentoring roles to or uh, play kind of an inclusive service um, leadership role. So I think a lot of what you were saying really echoes what I was going to say, but I think that what I'm going to say about service is very obvious. Um, one is that sort of uh, mid-career, I think at least we can see it in very positive terms that we can finally do what we want to do. Um, rather than maybe feeling as though we're, we're meeting expectations that are going to be articulated in a tenure document and therefore we need, a, especially for service day, we need a certain amount of coverage of different types. I think it's a very nice uh, moment to feel like, oh, I can choose what I want to be doing. I really can have this be more a reflection of what I feel I would like to do. I mean, hopefully that's already been true, but I think there's something again, about mid-career, where there might be this realization that there's much more ability to control it. Um, I think that that's what I would emphasize, is this idea of creating some sort of meaningful shape and a meaningful trajectory around service. Um, giving what you're doing beyond the teaching and research some sort of coherence that makes sense to you. Um, and I think, again, we're at a great university where the mission allows that service to be incredibly meaningful. Um, so I think finding what is meaningful to you and meaningful to the university, it sh I don't think it can be that, I don't think it's that difficult to find ways in which those two intersect and the service that you can do here can be kind of exponentially more meaningful than maybe at other universities where we don't have um, kind of the diverse student body that we have or the public mission that we have. So I think that, for me at least, um, being able to maybe have that time of reflection post-tenure to finally say, oh, I can choose and I can choose service to really become something that I feel is more meaningful in this sort of multi-layered idea of, of meaningful. Um, I found that to be very refreshing and to, again, sort of recharge the batteries and feel like, okay, I am ready to dive back into doing more service <laughs> rather than just saying, okay, I had tenure, now it's time I can get, sit, get to say no. <laughs> um, so I think it's more about shaping what you're saying yes to and figuring out what the shape of that is. And I think it comes back to balance where we're talking a bit about balancing the service alongside of the research and teaching. But I think within your service, um, to think about the balance within the service is maybe a helpful way to, to just focus on what you're doing service-wide. And think of balance the way we always, again, are encouraged to think about it in things like our AFRs. Think about the balance within the university, doing department-level service versus university-level service. But also I would say to think about, again, another sort of obvious form of balance is how much service are you doing as internal service, internal to the university? How much might be external, working with outside communities? Maybe that would be the type of move that you can make mid-career is to start to feel as though you can move beyond the university a bit. I think also to think a bit about balance um, around service that's a bit more individual focused, sort of very much motivated by yourself versus more collaborative forms of, of service, where you'd be seeing yourself as more working in a teamwork type of mode and feeling as though part of what you have to contribute is just being a, a, a kind, of, kind of positive team member side, not having to always be maybe the leader. Um, and I think the mentoring of, of younger faculty is finally a position we can step into <coughs> mid-career. So I think that there's um, a way to think of sort of the mentoring role uh, that kind of junior versus senior allows you to step into the mentoring. So that sort of mentoring is part of that balance also. 
So I, I guess that's one of the things that I would just put out on the table is just what are some new ways to think of the balance within service. Um, and obviously, I think that the most important part is, to, is it, it is a way to express your passions. And it is isn't a way to express different aspects of who you are, that kind of image of the tree that you put up that maybe you didn't feel you had the ability to express when you're being so concentrated on putting together the, the tenure, uh, the nicely aligned tenure portfolio, <laughs> that you can take risks. You can do something that's completely related to your scholarship if you feel like, OK, now I can finally get to that next project. And I want my service to align with that scholarship so I can finally get that done. Or I think it's very helpful to say, I want to do something completely different that I haven't done before. Because again, we're finally at a point where we can do that. We can say some yes to something that might not make sense, or that might seem a little out of the box. We, we finally have the room to be able to do that, and to, I guess, think of service as a place where you can take some risks. Um, I guess that's most of what I would say. I think that what's really heartening for me is seeing on campus things like the Office for Faculty Development growing up um, on campus, sort of budding around on campus to encourage different forms of service, um, along with the Office for Community Engagement, for example, so that we're starting to have institutional structures in place to encourage uh, ways that if you have an idea or have an interest, there are institutional structures now where you can go to for help in helping to define how that interest can become sort of a reality. So that might be something we could talk about in an open conversation is if you've got an interest, how do you actually make that into something that's service that can grow and then grow into a, a leadership position. But I, I think the fact that the institution itself is, is developing kind of growing new, new structures um, is very helpful. Uh, so now there's, there seems to be more formalized ways in which good ideas can be recognized. Um, so I think that's where I'll end. And then how about turn over to Rajani? Hey, everybody. Um, for those of you who came into the room a little late, I'm Rajani Srikanth. I'm a faculty member in the English department, and I um, direct the Honors College. So it is a college, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought I'd sort of try to structure this into the national picture, the picture on our campus and then bring it down to sort of the department level and the very personal level. And I'll try to keep to that structure as much as I can. Um, so I started to do a little bit of research about uh, moving up from sort of the associate professor level uh, to the full professor level. And um, it was very surprising because across the country, that is sort of the biggest quote unquote issue or problem, if you like. Um, some of it was startling because there was this um, higher ed um, article in which they had surveyed something like 11,000 professors nationwide. And most associate professors said, said that they felt much more depressed as associate professors than when they were coming up for tenure, <laughs> which was really surprising to me. Um, <laughs> I think what they felt was that when they were working towards tenure, they were very focused on a goal, they knew what they needed to accomplish, and that once they achieved tenure, it was like, well, what do we do next, mm -hmm. right? So that was informative to me. Um, a few institutions have done rather in-depth reports on their own institutions. So the University of Maine, um, one of their campuses, not the entire system, but one of their campuses, did a report in 2010. And what they found was that the um, people are confused about timing. When is the right time to go out for promotion to full professor? They're confused about the criteria because there's no clarity about what you need to do to become a full professor. And then there's very little support uh, within departments in helping them to strategize about how to move up to that full professor level. At, the, um, at Ohio State University, they're actually undertaking uh, a really close analysis of what they see as the incredibly dominant place that research and scholarship takes in any kind of promotion to full professor. 
and they're trying to figure out if there are other ways of uh, evaluating and recognizing people for what they do that are of enormous um, contribution to the campus, whether that's teaching or service and the kind of impact your work has at your institution and outside the institution. So they're looking at things in terms of impact. So I found that kind of useful. So it you know, helped me to um, understand this anxiety, which I certainly noticed in um, colleagues on campus. Um, and when I say anxiety, I don't mean, am I going to have my job or am I going to get to you know, be part of this community, but more, well, what's next <coughs> for me? And there are two colleagues that come to mind who are um, wonderfully productive, very different, but who, for very different reasons, ended up being in this associate professor role for many, 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 many years. One colleague um, kept publishing a lot and could very easily have filed for promotion to full professor, but her feeling was, well, I'm not going to be bothered because it's too much of a headache. I mean, and in some ways it is. You know, you send your file out in exactly the same way that you would for tenure. I mean, that was a surprise to me when I decided finally I was going to come up for promotion and realized I was going to go through kind of like a mini tenure review all over again, and, and it was daunting, right? So this, and the only reason I did it was that I felt real support for my department, and I'm gonna to come to that in a moment because I think that's really crucial. But this faculty member just thought, you know, I'm not gonna put my department through that and forget. It. But she was incredibly happy publishing, a very well-published person, and she retired as an associate professor even though she could very well have been full professor. Another person who is at the associate professor level said to me that I wish my department had mentored me the moment I got tenure. I wish somebody had said to me, you know, let's figure out what you want to do for the next five years, how you want to be sort of taking your research and scholarship, and what are the other ways in which you can be building up your profile so that when you finally do come up for full, the external reviewer is going to validate that. And she said, I'm not faulting my department. It's like we were all really busy. And this sort of goes back to what Peter was saying, that you know we were an institution that when I came here 15 years ago, I was the first person that my department had hired in 12 years. Mm -hmm. right? So there had been this long period of drought when there were no hires here. And then suddenly new people were coming on. Um, so there was so much work to be done that people got sucked <coughs> into all of the service. I distinctly remember literally the minute I got my tenure, someone turned around and said to me, you're chairing the DPC. And I almost died. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it's sort of important to think about the need for departmental support and departmental mentoring in setting a kind of you know, timetable that is not high pressure, but that feels like there's some kind of road ahead that your recently tenured professors can, can kind of follow. Um, I will say, and I do have to really thank my department in this, um, only because they've been incredibly supportive of all of the collaborations and crazy networks I develop. And this sort of goes back to what Bob was saying. You know, Judy wanted us to talk about what keeps us positive and what keeps us, um, I don't know, like focused on the future. And for me, it's always been about uh, feeding my multiple interests. I have found my department to be incredibly indulgent, almost, of my multiple interests. But I do want to say it's really important for you, if you have interests that cry out for collaboration across departmental lines, that your department support that. Um, let me just give you a, a, an example. There is a fairly new colleague in the English department now um, who we realized is very interested in human rights. And so we've tried to connect her with this large network on campus of people working on human rights. And she's incredibly thrilled with that. Right? So it could have been that her department could have said to her, no, you, know, you just focus on what you were hired to do from now until you get your tenure. But just to see sort of the light in her eyes of being able to do this collaboration, I think that's incredible. And I think that's important for departments to remember. That nurture your faculty members' multiple interests, even while you are, of course, mentoring them 
to, in the pre-tenure years, to stay somewhat focused on what they're doing. And I was glad people tried to do a little bit of that with me, otherwise I might never have gotten tenure. <laughs> but, but I think, you know, don't constrict people because sometimes the ability to do things outside of what's immediately required of you can nurture you and can fulfill you in ways that make you really more productive. Um, so I'll just sort of end by making a special plea to senior faculty members in various departments that it is important for your recently tenured faculty members to feel a departmental interest in their future. That not simply to see them as great one more person to serve on the curriculum committee, one more person to be on the DPC, one more person to be on the CPC. All of those are really important. Okay. So I don't want to at all minimize the importance of service, which as Cheryl has pointed out, we all do way too much of. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we also have to recognize that sometimes the things that keep us going are sort of the ability to dream creatively about our intellectual life, and it is important for departments, senior faculty members and departments, to create the atmosphere that, that signals this to our recently tenured members. I want to say something about non-tenure track faculty as well, and their promotion to senior lecturer. Um, I have the good fortune to know some incredible non-tenure track faculty who have in recent years been promoted to senior lecturer. And I found that what keeps them really going and positive is when they can be folded into the life of the department and when they can be integrated into the life of the university. There are people who do incredible service for the university and to the department who have been, you know, who have been here as non-tenure track faculty members for the last 10, 15 years. But what really energizes them is the sense of belonging. So once again, I want to make a special plea to the department that, you know, your non-tenure track members are also really important. And so please let them know that they are valued and give them opportunities to feel that they can grow within your department. Um, so I'll just stop there. Thank you. Um, I thank all these, all four panelists for these really.